It's a great pleasure to be moderating this session on Japan and the UK with two very respected academics from the area of refugee studies, Naoko and Georgia. Let me just say a few words by way of introduction to our topic before I hand over to them. According to UNHCR, the global number of refugees is currently around 27 million people. And this is the highest number that's been recorded for the last 30 years. Most of these refugees are located outside northern countries, often in some of the poorest states in the world. Yet it's hard to think of a Western government that isn't currently caught between the claims of refugees and forced migrants for uh, protection, claims that are often made at their borders, and the restrictive demands of large sections of their electorates, typically egged on by politicians hoping to use fear as a vehicle for political success. Everywhere one looks, refugee policy implicates questions of state sovereignty, national identity, and foreign relations, as well, of course, as the lives and futures of displaced people themselves. And this tension is powerfully evident today in the UK and Japan. Both countries have in recent decades demonstrated a great reluctance to host refugees. Japan, of course, has long proven notoriously reluctant to grant refugee status on its territory. It has a long history of seeking to use financial support for the UN and for um, and uh, humanitarian funding for refugees overseas as a substitute for admitting refugees. Japan's position has been underpinned by an official account of itself as pretty much a no immigration country, effectively a monoculture. By contrast, the UK has certainly accepted more refugees than Japan in recent years, albeit reluctantly through um, asylum processes. Moreover, while the matter isn't uncontroversial, Britain does recognize itself as an ethnically diverse society. But like Japan, Britain has powerful anti-immigration undercurrents and has a history of harsh po policies designed to deter refugee arrivals, including its current Rwanda deal designed to stop asylum seekers. For all that, in recent years, both the UK and Japan have made tentative steps towards opening themselves up to the, uh, to the resettlement of refugees. What is going on? The contradictory situation of both countries has in many ways been laid bare by the recent crises in Afghanistan and Ukraine. Refugees fleeing the Taliban during the last year have starkly challenged the idea that the relationship between northern countries and the world's refugees is simply a humanitarian matter. Over the last 20 years, the UK and Japan have been deeply involved in Afghanistan, in Britain's case, through direct military intervention. When the Taliban seized control last year, many people in the UK and Japan demanded that refugees be accepted, not for reasons of charity, but because to do otherwise would be to abandon people in whose plight these countries were deeply implicated. The war in Ukraine has been similarly revealing. The policies and practices of Japan and certainly of the UK have recently been built around the idea that refugees originate in poor, fragile states in the global south or from authoritarian regimes outside Europe. Yet here is a massive refugee crisis within Europe and one resulting because of an old fashioned foreign military intervention. As the side of the refugees has changed, so has the public and governmental response. Ukrainians have been greeted with an outpouring of massive public support and in a way reminiscent of the Cold War, they've also been constructed by governments partly as a tool in the fight against the illegal Russian intervention. Ukrainian refugees are themselves at no risk of being sent to Rwanda. The situation of Ukrainian refugees has therefore upended many of the basic assumptions of recent, um, of recent refugee responses 
by Northern states. And this current state of play leads to a number of questions. What are the implications of recent events for how the UK and Japan respond to refugees generally? How exactly has their response to Ukrainians and to Afghans differed from their response to other refugees? What explains the relative receptiveness of publics towards Ukrainians? There's also questions such as, are Japan and the UK edging, albeit unevenly and slowly, away from highly restrictionist policies? Or are the small changes we've seen in uh, recent years just minimal steps designed to legitimize closure in new contexts. What, if anything, can these countries learn from each other? And what should their respective roles in an international system of refugee protection be? Now, these are some of the questions that our speakers will be able to explore during our time in this session. Um, and after they speak, I'm going to ask some questions of them and get some discussion going there. But now let's turn to our speakers, starting with Naoko. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Jason and Matthew, for your very kind introduction. Um, it is absolutely my greatest uh, pleasure and honor to share a panel with such prominent scholars I've admired for many years. Matthew, you taught me politics and ethics of forced migration more than 20 years ago, and I followed um, George's work very closely. In fact, both um, your books that Jason mentioned, this is this is Matthew's book and this is uh, George's book, if you can see. Um, these are excellent books and then they have made it to the top of the required reading for my students. So for those students here, you are most um, encouraged to, um, to have access to these excellent books. Um, as much as I'd love to keep talking about how great these books are, but I have got only 15 minutes. So um, let me straight go to the main topic of my talk um, today. And, so basically, um, right, um, I hope you can see my next slide. Uh, basically, I would like to um, first go through very briefly the historical evolution of Japan's asylum policy since 1970s, followed by um, um, the issue of the stratification of rights and entitlements um, among various forced migrants in Japan. An analysis on why Japan, um, as, as Matthew mentioned, is so enthusiastic about admitting Ukrainian displaced by the Russian invasion, while it has been rather reluctant to do so for Afghan people who used to work for Japanese entities. And if time allows, I will also touch upon the future prospect for Japan's asylum policy. Right. So first, the history. Um, the evolution of Japan's asylum policy can be divided into six phases or six categories of people, if you like. The first is the Indo-Chinese refugee admission. Um, between 1978 and 2005, um, Japan admitted roughly 11,000 refugees and displaced people from Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. Some reached Japan spontaneously as boat people. Others came through um, resettlement route via, via other first countries of asylum, and others came via the family reunification scheme directly from Vietnam. The second phase is the individual asylum education process, which started in January 1982. Japan acceded to the 1951 Refugee Convention in June 1981. And by the end of last year, a total of 80. 7,000, and only I would say 87,000 asylum seekers spontaneously lodged asylum claims um, to the Japanese Immigration Bureau. Among them, only 900 people were officially recognized as refugees by the Japanese Minister of Justice. So this brings the refugee recognition rate to about only 1%, which is obviously very low as compared to that of other countries. In fact, I already explained the reasons why Japan's refugee recognition rate is so low and the previous events here in Daiwa. So I'm not going to repeat uh, what I have already explained before. Um, in addition to the full-fledged um, refugees, 3,000 asylum seekers were given special permission for residence on humanitarian grounds. This is rather different from the subsidiary protection in the sense of EU's qualification directive. This uh, special permission is rather close 
to the humanitarian admissions some European countries implement. I'm, I'm going to explain in more details in the next slide. The third phase uh, or group um, is resettlement of Myanmar refugees taking refuge either in Thailand or Malaysia. Between 2010 and 2019, only again, 194 Myanmar refugee, uh, refugees were resettled to Japan. Initially, the annual quota was only 30 individuals per year, which is minuscule and limited only to Myanmar refugees, but it was expanded to um, 60 refugees. I'm embarrassed to say this, but 60 refugees per year who are taking refuge anywhere in Asia. Unfortunately, uh, the COVID-19 has prevented um, this new expanded phase of resettlement from being implemented, but I hope that uh, the expanded um, phase will resume shortly. The fourth phase is the admission of Syrian refugees staying in the neighboring countries like Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon to Japan as graduate students. Um, the JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency round, admitted about 150 students over the past five years, while NGOs also admitted some. This um, can be understood as part of the so-called complementary pathways. The fifth uh, phase is the evacuation Afghan um, people who used to work for a Japanese embassy or JICA or NGO staff who, you, who were evacuated mainly through private sponsors. Um, I'm going to go into more details on, on, on this Afghan evacuation in the next slides. And finally, Ukrainians. Within the past four months, 1,400, more than 1,400 Ukrainians were admitted to Japan um, um, even though many of them had no previous connection or any family members in Japan. Just within a matter of four months, the Ukrainian population admitted to Japan exceeded the total number of refugees who got their refugee status since 1982. And this extraordinary enthusiasm about Ukrainian admission needs to be explained as I will do so later. Right, so this was the kind of overview of Japan's asylum policy since 1970s. Right, so next then, how are the rights and entitlements or assistance are provided for which categories of forced migrants in Japan? The group of people are, um, in a way that I've categorized, um, asylum seekers with either a regular or irregular residential status, refugees who receive the Convention refugee status or Indo-Chinese refugees or resettlement refugees, or failed asylum seekers who are granted the special permission for residence on humanitarian grounds, or Afghan evacuees supported either by the Japanese government or um, private sponsors, and the Ukrainian people displaced by the Russian invasion. And the rights, entitlement, um, assistance include, now from the top to the bottom, the travel to Japan, residential status, family unification, travel out of Japan, access to national health insurance, employment permit, public housing, schooling for minors, um, social welfare, or cash assistance, uh, public integration services, and specific assistance for asylum seekers. In the cell, um, I just was, I want to explain, um, the two double circles that you see mainly in, in the, in the, for the Ukrainians, those two double circles indicate that they receive preferential treatment only targeted um, for the particular group of people, in this case, Ukrainian people, and one double circle, like, like um, as you see here uh, or here, um, this indicates that they enjoy the right um, through the government intervention um, to access and enjoy such rights. Um, and single circle, like here and here, um, single circle means that they are entitled um, legally to such rights, but they have, they have to try enjoying or accessing the rights on their own. And um, triangles, uh, refer to um, um, triangle. Refer to the the they are. I mean, the, I mean the, the right and, and the kind of activity is not completely forbidden, but rather very difficult in reality to to enjoy or obtain. And the cross, um, like here and here, um, um, cross means that they are not entitled to such a right at all. So obviously, I don't have the time to go into you know, I mean, to explain every single cell. But then fundamentally, I would say there are two major problems um, in this categorization or stratification, in my view. So one problem is that obviously Ukrainian people are entitled to rights and um, assistance better than 
the full-fledged convention refugees, even if the Ukrainian people didn't go through the official asylum education process. They received by far the most generous preferential treatment among all the forced migrants in Japan so far. The second major problem, in my view, is the huge gap between the, the government-sponsored Afghan evacuees versus privately sponsored Afghan evacuees. So what do we mean? Um, what do I mean by that? Um, so let me explain more details about the differentiation between the government-sponsored Afghan evacuees and private-sponsored Afghan evacuees. So the Japanese government decided to evacuate among the Afghan people who used to work for Japanese um, organization in Afghanistan, only those who were directly employed by the Japanese embassy or JICA beyond 31st of August last year, and their spouse and or children only, on the premise that they would return to Afghanistan upon reopening of the embassy or JICA in Afghanistan. So this, it was not really, this evacuation was not based upon the logic of persecution threat that they fear due to their previous affiliation with Japan, but rather simply based upon the employment contract. If the Afghan person was working for Japanese NGO, only the employee themselves or allowed to evacuate um, while they have to leave their family members. I wonder if this can be called as a humanitarian action at all. As if this were not inhumane enough, um, those who could not join the government's, government evacuation scheme had to apply for visa and they had to secure the following, um, these conditions, um, four conditions, just to apply for visa. One, Japanese guarantor living in Japan who can submit proofs of financial capacity, capacity to support the evacuees for a long term. Two, valid passports for all the evacuees. But how can, how can you get passports from Taliban? Three, testimonies of the persecution threat due to their affiliation with Japan, either written in Japanese or English. And the potential evacuees would have to secure an employer, new employer or new institution in Japan for them to affiliate with prior to their entry to Japan. In a nutshell, I would say it was made almost impossible for those who were not included in the government evacuation scheme even to apply for a visa to Japan. That's naturally Japan managed to admit only 700 Afghan people since last August, while many other major donor countries which used to employ a number of local staff in Afghanistan evacuated already thousands of ex-local staff. In the case of the States, evacuation number exceeded 100,000 since last year. And those other countries like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, um, UK, Germany, Sweden, and also the States, they gave the Afghan evacuees either permanent residency upon arrival or exactly the same rights and entitlements as resettlement refugees. So I'm afraid I have to conclude here that the Japanese government failed to live up to the absolute moral obligation to rescue the ex-colleagues who are being persecuted due to their previous affiliation with Japan. Then, what explains this kind of huge gap between the treatment of Ukrainians on the one hand and that of Afghan people, um, particularly the, the, those privately sponsored on, on the other. So I would say one reason is probably that the simplistic narrative that Putin is evil, I mean, Putin's a vice and Zelensky is virtue. And, and, it, and it is very, this narrative is very easy for even lay people to understand in Japan. I mean, it is certainly true that Ukrainians, Ukrainian civilians are the victims um, while Putin and the Russian troops are aggressors. I mean, on the other hand, the situation in Afghanistan is not too simple. I mean, Taliban, um, the aggressor, are also um, Afghan people. And then some, for example, Pashtun people are not necessarily against Taliban. While, for example, Hazara Shia um, are obviously targeted by Taliban, and especially those who used to work for foreign troops or entities. I mean, this domestic situation in Afghanistan, it's probably too complicated for lay people. I mean, for example, such as my mother, for example, to understand probably. Second, some Japanese people may fear that um, Japan might be the next target of Russia. I mean, it is true that Russia and Japan are neighboring countries with some territorial disputes. 
Meanwhile, um, it is certainly unlikely that Taliban suddenly starts occupying Japan. Um, because of th these two reasons, there have been massive media coverage on the Russian invasion and Ukrainian victims. Also, it is easy, um, easier at least to film Ukrainian war victims since the vast majority of, Ukra um, of them are not necessarily targeted for discrimination or persecution by their own government or other domestic um, actors in Ukraine. I mean, they can relatively easily appear on media with um, no specific fear of retaliation. Meanwhile, Afghan people fearing persecution by Taliban cannot in any way appear on media with their identity made public for obvious security concerns, particularly for their family members back home. In addition, um, the majority of displaced uh, populations from Ukraine are women and children. While in the case of Afghanistan or any other Middle Eastern countries, it is not rare that young and healthy male first ventures out with the intention to invite other vulnerable family members later on. Um, sorry, I forgot to mention one thing. I mean, obviously, um, there is this really intricate issue of conscientious des deserters among Ukrainian male um, who do not want to fight for various reasons, but I, I will not go into the details here. Um, right. And also in the case of Ukraine, uh, the Japanese Prime Minister Kishida took initiative and repeated that Japan must take actions in line with other G7 countries. But I wonder why this narrative didn't come forward um, in the case of Afghan evacuations. Also, there seems to be a misunderstanding that protecting Ukrainians, pro would, um, protecting Ukrainians proactively would send a strong message to Putin. I'm not quite sure about that. In reality, Putin might actually, wouldn't, maybe Putin wouldn't mind it because less Ukrainian people resisting inside Ukraine might make Putin's invasion plan easier. Furthermore, among Japanese policymakers, especially um, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there seems to be a fear that evacuation of Afghan local staff would set a precedence and make it a quasi obligation to evacuate other local staff in other situations in the future. Meanwhile, admission of Ukrainians is obviously optional. I mean, I mean, there's a stronger moral obligation uh, for the Japanese government to admit ex-local staff who fear persecution rather than general Ukrainian populations fleeing the war waged by Putin. I mean, paradoxically, governments, including Japanese government, tend to be more proactive on something optional rather than obligatory. Also, there seems to be also an assumption that Ukrainian people would stay in Japan only temporarily until a ceasefire, while Afghan refugees would stay in Japan forever. And last but not least, is there an element of racial discrimination or prejudice? I mean, this is rather hard to prove it probably, probably scientifically, but I would certainly not deny the applicability of this racism hypothesis. Um, in fact, I have another slide on Japan's future asylum policy, but I, I, I know the clock is ticking, so I would stop here. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you now, Kerry. That was incredibly informative and you managed in that 15 minutes to cover a huge range of territory. Thank you very much. Um, let's turn to Georgia now. So I'm addressing um, some issues that are similar to those that have been raised by the previous speaker um, in relation to the increased complexity and fragmentation and at times discrimination of existing asylum and protection systems. So looking at challenges and opportunities, let me start just with a quick reminder of what refugee protection is um, meant to, to do. It is a set of activities and actions that aim at obtaining the full respect of the rights of individuals in need, and that includes the rights to move, the rights to have a to, to life, the right to um, health, education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it is uh, generally understood within the global system of nation states that we inhabit at this particular point in time that states do provide protection to uh, victims of um, persecution within their territory. But this protection of individual states then is expanded to become an international protection with states agreeing to have international responsibility to protect in accordance with the letter and the spirit of international treaties, namely human rights, humanitarian and refugee laws. And this 
kind of right frame framework within which refugee protection is constructed means that those who are at risk uh, of uh, persecution, at risk of violence, have the right to cross borders and to be accommodated and supported. And this is just to give an example spell out in a range of conventions. So the Human Rights Conventions, Article 14, states that everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. Also, the Article 31 of the Refugee Convention states that contracting states shall not impose penalties on account of their illegal entries or presence on refugees who coming directly from a territory where their life or freedom is threatened in the sense of Article 1, enter or are present in the territory without authorization, provided that they themselves you know, present to, to authorities and have a good reason for applying and explaining their illegal entry. And this I mention it because there are a lot of contentious issues around different approaches to uh, documented and undocumented routes for seeking protection. So having given this overall introduction on what rep refugee protection aims to achieve, let us look a bit more in detail at the ways in which the UK government through these recent schemes of the last year and the ongoing ones is promoting the convention and, and um, the protection of uh, refugees who have or, and people who seek asylum. So I've organized uh, this table around few main themes um, and looking at few main uh, groups. Um, again, in the spirit of today's looking at Ukrainians, Afghans, but also in comparison to many other uh, people who are cl cl claim and ask for asylum, um, including Syrians, et cetera, et cetera. So if we look at the protection status, we can see that there are different schemes that are put in place by the UK government with vis-a-vis -vis the Ukrainian recent um, uh, forced migration uh, move. We have the Ukrainian family scheme, whereby people with families in the UK can apply to join their families through family unification processes, Ukrainians in the country. We have the Ukrainian sponsorship scheme, which allows people to come to, to the UK and being sponsored by um, British families or people with residents, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have the recently the Ukrainian extension scheme that allows those who have been in the country before the conflict and in the last few months to also apply for protection. Now, most of these um, protection schemes are based on humanitarian grounds of people fleeing violence and persecution as a group. And therefore they are, um, uh, they, they give uh, three years protection uh, for the, the time being. This is different from the type of protection status that is being given to or offered that the UK government offers to Afghan citizens. Uh, so first of all, the recent, um, uh, so those who, um, the recent um, Afghan citizens resettlement scheme aims to support Afghan citizens who were supporting the efforts of the uh, co coalition and the UK coalition. And the aim is that 20,000 citizens will be relocated. But this is in addition to the Afghan relocation and assistance policy, which um, enable those who were working for the uh, UK embassies, the UK army as interpreters, translator, data analysts to come to this country uh, through the evacuation process. And this is also in addition to the regular UNHCR kind of pathway whereby people, Afghan citizens can apply for protection on uh, the grounds of individual persecution. And then they are given leave for uh, five years. This again is in conjunction or in relation to the existing ongoing scheme that the UK government has for people who apply for asylum once they reach the UK. And in last year, there were about 50,000 applications, most of them from uh, the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, and Syria, Africa, 23%, and then Asian European countries. This, the protection of those who apply for asylum depends on their individual kind of claim and then follows the 51 refugee convention or uh, protection depending on their situation. But what we see even from this initial kind of understanding of protection status is that there are different protection statuses for different groups. But also, we can also imagine that some Afghans may be both part of the resettlement scheme, but also come to this, to this country as asylum seekers. So they may be from the same group fleeing protection and being treated in different, through different routes. The admissions are different. We know that the UK government, similarly to the Japanese government, has been very, very generous with Ukrainians and has, it has a, an open system with no quotas. While for the Afghans, there is a quota of 20,000 over a five year period. And for asylum seekers, there isn't a quota, it's based on individual assessment. Uh, 
But what we also see is that people who come through different routes will have different access to and their rise to employment, welfare and accommodation is, is dependent on the route and the type of program they come in. So for um, Ukrainians and um, there is immediate access to work. For Afghans, there's a similar jobs first program that aims to integrate them very quickly. While for us, those who come in this country and they are in the asylum system, they are prohibited from work for the first 12 months and then they have restricted access to jobs on the shortage occupation list. Access to welfare is also different, whereby Ukrainians have uh, access like UK citizens. And there is a new approach for Afghans that puts them in the similar position where they have access to welfare. While for those who are in the asylum system, there is a separate kind of pathway where they are given an allowance, which is below poverty level of 36 and 95 pounds a week. Accommodation is also differently provided with Ukrainians. There is the Ukrainian family scheme and the sponsorship scheme that allows Ukrainians to be with families. With Afghans, similarly, there are uh, people who are, are resettling families, but also in hotels and temporary accommodation. And for asylum seekers, wh while they're in the process, they, they will predominantly be um, placed in temporary accommodation and dispersed across the country. Now, I have given you this brief overview just to give you an indication of the uh, challenges and complexities that these kind of uh, different ways of providing protection present. And let me start by saying that the challenges and opportunities um, are there, but there are many more challenges that, than opportunity at the present time. So if we look at these different ways of providing protection and supporting people fleeing violence, we can see that these different fragmented and differentiated uh, approaches create some challenges. As already mentioned, there is a risk that we are creating hierarchies of what become deserving and undeserving refugees. People who equally flee the same conflict, but depending on how they come, which program they fit in, which connection they have to the country, to, they may be treated differently. And there are racialized undertones with language that uh, you know, describes people fleeing the Ukrainian conflict as victims, as brothers, etc., and sisters, and those fleeing Afghanistan or other countries as a threat, and so on and so on. And this then results in what um, is connected, which means that there is not only like a language difference, but this language difference also means that the lives of uh, people who seek protection are affected because the, we can see that we have intersecting categories of privilege for resettlement in the UK, with certain individuals being given indefinite leave, access to work, and others not being given the same right, uh, the same protection status. And the recent uh, Nationality and border, Borders Bill has been um, described as, 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 as a policy that is becoming more kind of restricted towards the protection of people from as, um, asylum, relegating most refugees into the uh, lesser status with fewer rights and benefits, and then having few exceptional refugees who may be given the same protection that the UK used to give you know, 20 or 30 years ago to everybody coming to this country. So what we can see is that in addition to creating these hierarchies of deserving and more or less deserving refugees, we also have for those who reach the UK repercussions um, when they are in the country. The many commentators have been describing the UK as a hostile immigration environment for those who come, mainly because the, the set of kind of restrictive policies that have increased over the years have translated into public opinions, media representations of, of um, people coming to this country that have affected the ways in which the general population deals with um, with different with different people, different people seeking asylum. So that has allowed a normalization of these hierarchies of refugees, whereby then we can, we can see that people seeking being in the asylum system uh, can, can, can survive on less than what is being described as the poverty minimum poverty level to live in this country. But also we can see that we have a criminalization based on asylum rules that also affects um, the whole population, also British racialized citizens. So for instance, there was a scheme in the UK a few years ago called, called Go Home that affected not only people who were uh, coming into this country through the undocumented routes, but also British residents who were similarly of Afghan or um, other uh, black and brown um, minor communities. So we can see that th this presents challenges for refugee protection within the country. But it also presents challenges more broadly to the international agreement on the basis of which international protection is being based. 
and what it does in a way weakens the international refugee regime protection. So we, we have mentioned, it has been mentioned that the recent UK Rwanda deportation policy was um, going through, um, uh, through parliament and has been, has been challenged. Um, and that meant that people coming into the UK as of January of this year through the undocumented route were automatically being deported to Rwanda. And if their case for asylum was being granted, they were not allowed to come back to the UK, even if they have family members, but they had to, to, be, to remain in Rwanda. This has been described as an outsources of the responsibility to protect because states have a responsibility to listen to people claiming asylum. There is also another way in which some of the recent policies of the UK government undermine and weaken refugee protection more generally. So a whole range of states have um, uh, signed the Global Compact on Refugees, which isn't a, a binding document, but in a way spells out that states have um, the responsibility to protect and also to share the burden. We know that many refugees, 85% of refugees are hosted in, in, a, in the regions and very few reach places like the UK. So this idea of burden sharing, the outsourcing of this responsibility to protect also undermines the, the principle of burden sharing. Also by having bilateral agreements and, and these cooperations that are in a way outsourcing, are um, offshoring, et cetera, et cetera, we can see that the international system is being weakened because if they become, they, they enter into competition. And lastly, we've seen how COVID has created immobility for all um, people fleeing persecution. They weren't able to cross borders. They weren't able to apply for asylum, et cetera, et cetera. And this is creating a whole new kind of set of questions around who has access to movement and who does not have access to movement at times of crisis that um, you know, have COVID has highlighted. There are also a whole set of le lessons that we can learn and opportunities. So I'm listing some of them in the spirit of um, optimism. So one is that the generous approach towards Ukrainians could be extended, could not just be the exception to the rule, but could become the normal. And in the UK government, we have a policy of leveling up, making everybody you know, level up to the best possible standard. So maybe we could consider leveling up the asylum uh, and resettlement and protection schemes to those that are being offered to, to Ukrainians. Another positive step is that the, uh, there was a challenge to this uh, UK Rwanda deportation flights and it was successful, it's now been postponed um, to the court to, to September. But this could give um, activists a, a kind of something to, to work towards the expansion of legal, safe and humane routes to seek protection. We've also seen that the Ukrainian um, crisis, I've, I've seen that if the governments, if media have positive approaches to people fleeing conflicts and create empathy, the British public becomes very, very generous. So we could capitalize on this generosity to, to see refugees as right-bearing individuals in need of protection and create homes and create accommodation and support them more generally. We've also seen that solidarity groups um, have um, increased and become stronger because of this adversity. So we have, you know, over the last few years, while the government has created a hostile environment, at grassroots level, there have been many initiatives that have become uh, welcome refugees, such as the Cities of Century, Universities of Centuries, the Refugee Welcome Movement. And this solidarity could be strengthened to become a, a movement that counteracts some of these hostile environment policies. I also think that internationally, there is um, something good that could come out from uh, this point of conjunction, which is that we have um, refugee situations, regional refugee situations across the world. And there are initiatives that are quite open, such as the, uh, uh, the residency agreement uh, that grants residence, residency rights as an alternative to protection to people within uh, Latin America. European Union type open borders approaches that could allow people fleeing conflict to have some sort of protection and allow them to flee and, and, and make a living. So to conclude my presentation, the point that I want to make uh, more general is that similarly to the recent pandemic, the economic crisis, we have witnessed the climate change issues, refugee protection and migration are global issues that require global approaches and that bilateral ones tend to undermine these global approaches that could be emphasized. And in this respect, a cooperation between Japan and the UK, or at least some sectors of the population is something that is to be welcomed. 
So we could say that similarly to the pandemic, these intersecting crises are always an opportunity. They can represent an opportunity to move forward and have more progressive and welcoming policies or to have a setback and, and retreat into what become very uh, borders, um, border uh, societies. And in this respect, I hope that maybe we can uh, borrow from uh, a poem by Arundhati Roy. She describes COVID, but I want to describe this intersecting crisis as either an opportunity or a setback. So let me conclude by quoting her uh, a couple of uh, um, paragraphs from her poem, The Pandemic is a Portal. So it is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudices and hatred our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through it lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Georgia. I think uh, you both showed us the challenges there, as, uh, but also provided elements of hope and optimism in the UK context. And I think that's really achievement to do that in the UK context. Perhaps then I can um, ask uh, some questions to get the um, discussion going. And I think that one of the commonalities um, across the uh, two presentations we saw was this idea of differential inclusion in the two countries concerned. Um, differential inclusion across historical time, uh, at, but also across groups, uh, that some groups getting much lower status than um, other groups, and some countries being more open at certain times than others. What I really wanted to ask you is what's driving that differential exclusion? You started to talk about that, Georgia, but in terms of the actual actors, I'm wondering what the role of, here of public sentiment and civil society plays in actually shaping that uh, broader environment of inclusion for various groups. Does it influence refugee policy? Is it a powerful counter to the state in each of the two countries that you're talking about? Um, which sections of the population find themselves interested and concerned in refugee issues. I'm just thinking of that because I think it's important to understand the kinds of actors that, that are actually uh, behind moments of inclusion if one's going to push for broadening that out to various different groups. And it'd be nice to get some kind of comparative perspective on that. Would you like to start now, Kurt? Sure. Thank you very much. I mean, th this is interesting. I mean, is it is, is it the government or is it the public um, opinion that leads, you know, which is the independent variable, which is the dependent variable? It's, it's, it's an excellent question. But in case of Ukraine, um, I mean, the, the response, Japanese responses to Ukrainian, I mean, the, the assistance was outpouring from every corner, I would say, um, various corners of Japanese society, including not only the government, Prime Minister Kishida, as I mentioned, but also companies, uh, language schools, local municipalities, um, it's really outpouring. But then mm, your question is, so was it Prime Minister who led, who, um, whose opinion resulted in the massive public um, or private support? That, that, that's, um, that I, I, I don't have any answer, but then um, what I think is that in terms of Afghanistan also, there have been great pressure from also members of parliament, um, NGOs, um, Japanese NGOs who used to employ those, you know, Afghan people back back in Afghanistan, and also, you know, for, for example, um, um, I have appeared on, on on TV and also I've been, uh, written an opinion piece on newspaper, and I mean to promote more generous admission of uh, Afghan people, and then they've been like retweeted or you know, I mean, copied and pasted a number of times, but then for some reason that voice didn't reach. The, the Japanese um, government. So, um, but then also I, I would add another factor that is media. So how media, basically decision makers in the government, uh, civil, I mean, general public and the, the government, um, who decides what? I mean, I, sorry, I, I just gave you my, my immediate thought, but I, I don't have any, you know, I mean, good answer, conclusive answer to your excellent question. 
But thank you, Naoko. Um, Georgia. Yeah, I think that different actors play a role and also they're not homogenous actors. So yeah. the state is and, and government and the parliament is composed of different actors. Similarly with the media and with the general population. So there would be activists, those who are part of refugee welcome movement who might not be the same as the maybe, you know, the general population. So I think that what we need to think about is more like in terms of processes and, and, and kind of dissonance or consonance. So there'll be a different point in time when there will be forces that, conf that kind of come together in a certain way, like with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's incredible what has happened with Ukraine. But of course, Ukraine is in the region, even though probably Ukraine is uh, you know, as far away as Yemen. Yeah, but there is something in our public imagination about Ukraine being part of Europe that makes us a regional kind of um, country. And this is why there is this confluence of all of media, uh, you know, politicians from across all parties, as well as the general population. I think that what is interesting in terms of moving forward are grassroots initiatives. I think that the expansion of cities of sanctuary is very important because when, when no ordinary citizens who may not have an interest, may not be activists, they can empathize, they get to know people who come in their stories. I think they will be able to then in the future be, become more proactive in saying this, you know, we want these people or we want fairer routes or we don't want to penalize something, somebody just because they came as undocumented migrants. In time, there have been uh, different forces at play. Yeah, I suppose the concern is though that if it does require that kind of confluence, then it's only going to appear from time to time and it may be quite superficial last for a period. We saw in the UK, for example, and I'm not sure about Japan here, a really big uh, movement of public support for Kosovans um, in the late 1990s as well, which kind of disappeared almost as quickly as it came and didn't really feed its way into other groups. So um, the point, I suppose, is really to to capture it and to try to use it in some ways to reorient ideas around refugee protection. But that's fascinating. Another issue that I wanted to raise is slightly different in that respect, in that um, in many respects, um, the groups we're talking about um, uh, being accepted and being at the top of the hierarchy are groups that are um, arriving as resettled refugees rather than asylum seekers at the border. And I suppose a couple of questions emerge from that, whether in some respects in both the UK and Japan, the future lies in resettlement of refugees with a kind of Australian type hostility to arrivals at the borders, that that proves itself much more politically acceptable. Um, and the next question that flows from that is whether you think if that's true, that is um, a good thing, uh, whether the UK and Japan could carve out a space for themselves as large scale resettlers of refugees, um, but at the cost of hostility evident in the UK in the Rwanda deal to people arriving spontaneously at the borders. Georgia, would you like to start on that one? Yeah, um, I start from the kind of the, the position that people who flee wars and persecutions should not be criminalized or should not be their right to protection should not be dependent on whether they make it into a, a you know, a, a privileged resettlement program or whether they find other ways. So given the fact that people have a right according to a lot of international instruments to protection and to free their borders, I think that the idea of creating uh, this disparity binary between mm -hmm. you are either resettled so I choose you but if you challenge my choice and come because you choose to try and give it a go then I'm going to punish you I find that slightly problematic I also find it problematic on another ground which is that then countries can decide about numbers on the top of their head so it can be 5,000 this year if I you know with Afghans it can be uh, you know, 20,000 with Ukrainians, and it can be like in the case of Japan, 50, you know, for Syria, from Syria. So this creates like very different, uh, we're looking at millions of people fleeing. I understand that it's not possible to accommodate all of them, but I think that there needs to be standardized 
and fair and legal rules that would give all people free in persecution an equal chance to seek protection. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, now, Kurt. I think th thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to actually clarify what I have written a few years ago. Probably you saw it. Um, basically, um, yeah, I mean, let me start with the conclusion. Resettlement cannot be an alternative to asylum, should not be, cannot be, at least under the current circumstances. I mean, first of all, obviously, it, I mean, we all agree that, you know, every human being has got a right to seek asylum. You know, that's, you know, if you're deprived of that, you know, you deprive the individual human beings from, you know, right to seek asylum, and that would be violation of human rights. And also, I mean, if everything is organized according to, you know, I mean, resettlement, that would de deprive the, you know, individuals of the agency, human agency. Um, having said that, um, I, I would like to propose a few um, conditions. Um, for instance, hypothetically, if all major global North countries start massive in-country asylum um, processing in major, I mean, refugee producing countries. And if would be refugees in their country of origin are given immediately humanitarian visa to safely travel to the potential host country. And if, the, if, if that is met, if those two conditions are met, and also if, you know, that, that would be kind of, could asylum route if you like, right? In addition to that, if all refugees in the world who are assessed to be in need of resettlement by UNHCR, I think it would be like 1.5 million or 2 million refugees per year. If all these refugees in need of resettlement are quickly given resettlement seats, um, opportunities, then uh, I mean, it's completely hypothetical. I mean, I don't, I don't see all these conditions to be met in any, you know, I mean, time in near time in the future, but if these conditions are completely met regularly and uh, predictably, then I, I hope I hope to come. I hope the situation will come soon when anyone fearing uh, persecution threat would not need to risk their life um, in seeking asylum abroad. So again, I mean, the conclusion is resettlement should not re replace asylum under the cur current circumstances. But still, I would. I mean, I, I mean, you know, like have to wait and leave. Um, you know, proposal, you know, 20 years ago, uh, I wouldn't completely deny the slim opportunity to make it happen in the future, I hope in the future. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. And on a related question, um, Georgia, you started to touch upon this, and I thought very interestingly that um, too, but I just want to get the the view of both of you on the role of the Refugee Convention in what's happened recently, because in many respects, this huge response to Ukrainians and a lot of what's going on in um, in the case of Japan as well um, is happening outside the Refugee Convention, the 1951 UN Refugee Convention. What does it tell us about that convention? Is that convention in some ways becoming a kind of irrelevance? And should we think, well, if that is the case, should we worry about that when there are expansive protection possibilities available through, for example, EU statuses or through um, other forms of uh, protection within state legal systems, albeit presumably temporary forms of protection. Mm. Um, now, Ko, do you want to start on that with that? Wow. But I mean, it, it's another <laughs> very good question. I'm, I'm happy that I'm no longer your student, actually. I'm <laughs> failure test. Well, I'd be giving you the answer then. <laughs> no. Yeah, Not that I have one. one. <laughs> as a big fan of 1950 Refugee Convention, I wouldn't like it to be sidelined, obviously. Um, and actually, I like, probably, I, I can't really answer the question, but I was, I I was happy that uh, Refugee Convention wasn't rewritten during the Global Compact um, um, procedure, you know, process. I mean, it was confirmed. All the major, there was a fear at some point that you know the global, global Compact process might actually water down. For example, the principle of non refoulement or actually, as as Georgia mentioned, penalization of you know irregular asylum seekers. But it didn't at least happen. So I would I would interpret at least in the global compact process that the governments 
most of the governments who joined the process managed to reconfirm their previous commitments, at least not necessarily res proactive responsibility sharing, but still at the very basic level, they, they, they have reconfirmed. So I, I still hope the Refugee Convention will be our guide, our, our, our guideline, um, continue to be our guideline in the future. Thank you. Georgia. Yes, I, um, I tend to agree that although the Refugee Convention is quite, um, you know, dated in certain ways, let alone like the definition of refugee that doesn't include a she. But I, I agree that at this moment in time, um, all the achievements and gains that were made when there was a more kind of um, holistic understanding of why people fled, et cetera, et cetera, should remain. So my approach is that the Refugee Convention should is still a bastion. It is necessary for it to remain at the moment, but it is not sufficient. So all other conventions, even the you know, African Union Convention of you know, uh, the 1960s was more generous than the 51 Convention. So there are kind of the Cartagena Declaration. So it is in a way one could say that these more recent conventions and treaties, et cetera, et cetera, are addressing some of the current issues. At this moment in time, the convention is being eroded. Like in the UK now, even if you get refugee status, according to the convention, you're not allowed to be in the UK forever. So there's been an erosion. You can be there for five years and then your status will be revisited. So there are already all these attacks on multiple sides. But I think that this anchor of rights should uh, are better there than not being there at this particular point in time. I think that that's the key thing at this particular point in time. Thank you very much, Georgia.